Hello, Shabbat Shalom. Hello. Um, so I have the Torah portion today, obviously. Um, let's pull up my handy dandy notes real quick. Sorry about that. Okay. This one, oh, there it goes. Sorry about that. Come on, phone. Thank you. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's called NASO. Take a census. And in this, it is in it is in numbers, correct? Yes. yes. It's like numbers four to seven, right? What, it starts number one. Oh, maybe I saw the wrong Torah portion. <laughs> Laura, does this Torah portion na- is it NASO this week? Whoopsie. Maybe when I looked up the Torah portion for this date, it was a different information than the one we do, which is kind of unfortunate. But let's see here. Laws about the transportation of the tabernacle, Nazarite vows, the jealous husband, communities, responsibilities for ceremonial uncleanness, the priestly blessing, which is really great, and the consecration of the tabernacle. Much, much, much more than I can do any justice to. So I will talk about just one verse. (laughs) <laughs> after uh, and this is of course assuming I found the right Torah portion. After 88 verses in chapter 7 in Numbers regarding the consecration of the tabernacle and collective offerings from the chiefs of each of the 12 tribes, it ends. So there's a lot, a lot of repetition and a lot of um, a lot of, of ceremonial stuff, rites and stuff that God commands. And after all of that, It wraps up in verse 89. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with Yahweh, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Testimony, from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. Man, would anyone like that? Would anyone really, really just not want that? Because that would make them terrified for their life. Both. (laughs) After all the work of dedicating the tabernacle and its consecration, Moses heard the voice of God. Do we hear the voice of God? Why and why not? I tend to over-scrutinize whoever's speaking in front of me. I will run it through a sieve, run it through a filter, whatever, and try to verify if what they're saying is scriptural if their attitude seems sincere, et cetera, and so forth, which is great. We're supposed to be shrewd as serpents, right? As harmless as doves, but you can be too shrewd and then you end up filtering out all the minerals and all the stuff the Spirit's trying to speak to. Because if you're sitting there being so shrewd that you can't let the Spirit speak to you, you can't get the nutrients. But then there's some who don't scrutinize at all because they believe in the power of God, but they, don't, they forget to be as shrewd as serpents. And so they believe whoever speaks authoritatively, whether or not it's scripture or whether they're sincere. And then you fall into false doctrine and false ways of living and, and tickling ears and all that stuff too, which is neither, neither are good on either side of the line. Um, we are the children in the marketplace I'm sorry, that was a total change of subject. We are the children in the marketplace. Do you remember when the king said, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. They say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. When his apostles ask, tell us, when will these things be and what will the sign be of your coming and at the end of the age? Yeshua says, after describing events that cannot have even now taken place fully, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. This generation will not pass away. For your consideration, I think we are of the same spiritual generation as believers then 
in how we approach our relationship with him and that we will not allow ourselves to be moved. In Acts, Peter, having just been baptized with the other followers of Yeshua, baptized with the Holy Spirit, addresses the great crowd of people gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those received his word and were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. By the Holy Spirit through Peter, they were moved. On this rock, I will build my church, Peter. Nothing will move us because of pride. Someone speaks about God's biblical grace and we think, so you're saying I can do anything I want because I believe in Jesus. Someone will speak about God's biblical power, miracles, revelation, and prophecy, and, we, and, and how he can still do it all today. And we think, you want God to perform for you, don't you? <laughs> Someone will speak about God's biblical justice, law, accountability, and correction, and we think, judge not, lest you be judged. So what can move us? What is God left with? The Pharisees were rebuked by Christ, not because they didn't appear to obey God, but because they didn't obey God. Their heart was not broken by the truth and couldn't be broken. They were too righteous to need to be broken. We need to be broken. Psalm 51, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Somebody told, I heard a podcast or something once and, he, and the guy was saying, you don't want to pray that God humbles you because he will. And you don't want that. Humble yourself. The Pharisees could read unlike many and they knew this verse well. They knew but did not apply. Christ told the Pharisees in John chapter 8, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe. But what is belief? James says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you by faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Abraham believed and was counted to him as righteousness. But the way he lived, however imperfect at times, was based on his belief in the promises that God gave to him. His actions proved that he believed God's word. I tend to over-scrutinize. I'm so sorry. I copied my notes twice. Ha <laughs> ha uh, I was just getting good too. I read one was. Um, oh, okay. At the beginning, I read, and when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with Yahweh, he heard the voice speaking to him above the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Testimony from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. Moses had believed enough to obey, and only then did God begin to speak. We are told that Moses was the most humble man on earth. He was obedient. This is largely why God chose to reveal himself so intimately with Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face, none like him, for all the signs and the wonders that Yahweh sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants, and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. The resume of the humblest man on earth. <laughs> but one has arisen greater. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. And though he was greater than Moses, he was more humble right? Because he was God. He humbled himself and took on the form of a man. 
He chose to humble himself. Forgive me if this is too, like, inaccurate. I think it's accurate. But it, it, I came to this thought. I was like, humility, I would try to define it as knowing your place and walking in it. Because some of us are in positions of greater authority than others. So how does anyone, everyone stay humble at the same time? Because you're in your place, because God put you there, because he's greater than everybody, and everybody is all one in Christ. God defines everything. Humility. And again, filter through everything that you need to on that, but that's what came to me. So let's humble ourselves and see the greatness of God's plan for us unfold. Shabbat shalom.